Okay, everybody. Sorry, I had to have a bit of a of a late start. Is the audio out for anyone? Hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. I can hear you now. I just I didn't know that you weren't talking yet. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay, everybody. So uh, here we are at. Uh, this is officially class number. Let's see. We had two the first week and three five. Class number six, and it's it's only the um, one two yeah no class number seven, and last week we had live classes on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So this is only uh, our fifth live class, and it's been pretty intense. You think about it, in fifteen classes, we have to cover one semester's worth of material semesters, you know, 13 weeks or, you know, or nine weeks or whatever it is. It's, it's, it's a lot. So I hope that it's going okay for you. People seem to be doing the homework. Uh, okay. Uh, we did the Babylonians, spent a few days on them. Then we spent two days on Egyptians. And now we move to our next, uh, our next culture, which is China. And every culture has sort of a, a document that is like the, you know, the most famous one, the most important one, the most, gives us the most information. So uh, for the Babylonians, you know, Plinth in 322 with the Pythagorean triples is, is like the one, if there's one artifact, you know, the name of it's that uh, for the, Egyptians, it is uh, Rhine Papyrus. That's just the Rhine Papyrus. I think aside from the Rhine Papyrus, there's a couple of little like fragments of scrolls, something called the leather scroll. There's, there's, like, there's like fragments, but the Rhine Papyrus is pretty amazing. It's, it's, it has these 85 questions, all the, all the detail. And in China, the book is called the Nine Chapters on the mathematical arts. That book is um, pretty extensive. Whoops, someone just come in. Uh, Wikipedia says that it was composed by several generations of scholars from the 10th to the second century BC. So we're talking about from for 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 eight hundred years. They refined this this book that's called the Nine Chapters on the Mathematical Arts, and uh, somewhere around three hundred BC. I think it's 260 BC. We get finally a um, our first mathematician whose name we we know because in Egypt, yes, we have the scribe that copied, you know, the 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 Ami scribe for for um, for Plinton 322 um, for 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 Ryan Papyrus, um, but we we generally don't know the, the mathematicians' names from Babylonian times and Egyptian times. Uh, but 260 BC, we get this person, okay, Leo, Leo Hui is, is how you say his name. And Leo Hui is kind of like the Archimedes of Chinese math. And in China, he'd be a lot more of a household name. Now, not that Archimedes is a household name in the Western, but, but, it, but it, people know the name Archimedes. But here's our first person who's real important that has, that has a name, that we know the name, Liu Hui. He wrote an extensive, he wrote a commentary 
on the nine chapters book. And the commentary is, is, is longer than the, than the book. Um, it advances everything. So it's kind of like in, in, in like, you know, Jewish culture where you have like the Old Testament and then they have the Talmud, people write like commentaries on New Testament and then people write commentaries on people's commentaries and commentaries on people's commentaries. That's what happens with this nine chapters. People, it was written and revised and improved upon over a period of 800 years. So that's a very famous book, The Nine Chapters of the Mathematical Arts. I had read a lot of excerpts from it. But if you go to Amazon and you say, okay, I, I'd like to just own, you know, a, a copy of that uh, nine chapters of the mathematical arts. Unfortunately, the only, the only English translation costs $460. So I once found one for $200 and I said, I gotta get that, what a bargain. I saved $260. So I, I own a copy of this, a $200 copy. I would have ne never bought, it. if it originally was $200, I would never bought it. But when it was on sale from 460, I, I got a copy. Um, incidentally, if you are native, uh, Chinese speaker, you can get uh, you can get untranslated copy for for just like like uh, I think I have the untranslated copy that was only like twenty dollars, but I, I I I can't I can't read it, but it's I have students who can, so I kind of like to I like to have that. Anyway, nine chapters of the mathematical arts was purchased March six. 2018, but I did not pay $460. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a great, great, it's a great book, uh, Chapters of Mathematical Arts. So we're gonna start looking at some of the, um, at, at some of the math that, that, that's in there. And the first one is a, uh, a square root algorithm. Another, so not the Babylonian square root algorithm, the Chinese square root algorithm. So here is a number, 56,169. And if you have a calculator handy, with, don't use the square root button, but just, just through trial and error, it, it has an integer answer. Just mess around for, for a minute just to, you know, what is it? What's the answer? I mean, it's, okay, so we want to volunteer nice. to give their um, sequence of test numbers they tested as they did this, just to just to see like what does it look like when you do a trial and error. I'll do do a hand raise in the in that chat thing, and I'll have someone read off their um, sequence of guesses that they that that they took if they were just squaring. Okay, there I see. Okay, John, what was your sequence of? Uh, so of guesses? I knew that seven times seven was forty-nine, and I knew that eight times eight was sixty-four. So I just started checking seven point one, seven point two, seven point three, seven point four, 
and so it's between 7.4 and 7.5. For fifty. Oh, oh, I see. This, this is this is a comma, not a decimal point. But that, but yes. So, so, so maybe we should say like, uh, like between seventy and eighty. Oh. But that's all right. Seventy I'm squared. Sorry. I'm sorry. I thought it was fifty-six and one sixty-nine. My apologies. Oh, oh I see. Yeah. I see. You know well, what? Yeah, Anybody seventy and eighty. Not... I would have started with seventy, and I would. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. But seventy squared is forty-nine hundred, so it's in a different. And 700 squared is too big. So we're actually not in the sevens. Uh, so a, a kind of funny thing about square roots, I find it kind of, kind of funny. You know, the square root of four is two and the square root of 400 is 20. And the square root of four zero 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 is 200. But the square root of 40, you know, is six point something. And the square root of 4,000 is 60 point, you know, 60 something. So there's almost like, depending on whether it's got like an odd or even number of digits, it's like, there's like sometimes, so this, this square root of 56,000 might be like 70 or 700, or it might be 20 something or 200 and something. So uh, someone I else wanted to raise a hand and get I was thinking, sorry, now that I know what it is, I, I would say between 200 and 300. So I would, try to narrow it down between that range because 200 squared is 40,000 and 300 squared is 90,000, right? That's right. So I would do that. Now, so we know it's 200. We got like that digit locked in. Yep. I don't have a, a sequence of guesses now that we got 200 and something. I'll go for another volunteer. I see you, Crystal. Hi. So I did something similar to what John did. I, um, I did 200 squared and did 300 squared. And then I did a uh, 250 squared next. And then I found mm -hmm. that was um, too big. So it's between 200 and 250. Mm -hmm. um, then I just kept going for like 225, like, you know, like really nice round half numbers, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, and what, what happened after 225? Uh, 50,625. Okay. So a little too, too high. And what so did you still end too up high. with? And no, wait, it's too wait, it's too low. Oh, that one was too low, okay. Yeah. So then I went up to like 230, and then I just kind of went up incrementally from there. So 230 is uh 52,900, and then I just kept going up, and then I landed on 237 finally. That's right. Thank you. No problem. Now sometimes the thing we're trying to find the square root of is not a perfect square. Uh, in this case, it was. If we know it's a perfect square, there are some tricks you can do. Again, we don't know it's a perfect square when we start the question, but if we were told that it is a perfect square, we can see, you know, three squared is nine and seven squared is 49. And any other number squared does not get you a, uh, any other digit squared does not get you a nine in the unit's place. So we, we might even be able to do, again, that's if we knew, which we were not told that this was a perfect square, but if we were, we might be able to like narrow down the last digit, you know, to three or seven. Again, most numbers, the vast majority are not perfect squares. Now the, the Chinese algorithm for square root is really, really clever. Here's how it works. Suppose we're trying to find the square root of 1,369. The Chinese math, their algebra, their algorithms, I should say. I mean, may, just make a note here. Unlike the Babylonians and the Egyptians, Chinese algorithms are very geometrical. What I mean by geometrical is, remember the Babylonian, you know, x plus y squared, my, or x, x minus y squared plus 4xy equals x plus y squared. How they came to that, you know, they could some kind of trial and error, just noticing that when I add two numbers, versus subtracting two numbers and squaring it, what happens? But a geometrical picture 
I had drawn, remember the floor tiles? We really don't have a lot of evidence that the Babylonians used this geometrical reasoning to do to make their algorithms. But for China, we do. They, they, there's, there's all kinds of evidence that they had a geometrical way of thinking about things. So here's the insight. Square root of 1369. Here's the big like instructional example. Just like John described, you know, 30 squared is 900, so that's too small. And 40 squared is 1600, which is too big. So it's, it's 30 something. And here is the sneaky idea. If a square has area 30, 1369, then the side of that square would be the square root of 1369. But well, what's the side of that square? Well, we know it's between 30 and 40. So if we were to kind of chop off you know, 30, I, I don't know how big to make this thing, but if, actually, yeah, I don't, I, don't, so I don't know exactly how big this is. Is it 31 units? Is it 39 units? I don't know. So I'm just gonna go like this and just say from here to here, I'm calling that 30. And this little piece is the rest. If this is 30, you know, each of this would be 10, 10, 10. And this should be less than, less than a third of the other piece and it is, but it doesn't even matter, but don't make it too big. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see you go like this, you know, 30, because that's not accurate. That, that other piece is between zero and 10. Now, put that 30 over here also. And then we, Kind of imagine this is some kind of like material like it's made out of something metal or something and we sort of subtract we, we we cut off the 30 by 30 square which is 9,000 sorry which is 900 and now we have a new question if we if we get rid of that thing and we call this, I'm gonna call this X right now. We have now a new question. How can we get this L-shaped thing to be the right side? How big does that L-shaped thing? And here we'll have someone raise a hand in the, in the chat. How, what's the area? What is the area of that L-shaped thing? need to be 469 469 that's right so we do algorithm wise we end up doing 1369 minus 900 so i'm going to write in you know 469 now here comes a sneaky question what in terms of x what is the area how could you describe, so, so something has to equal 469. But, but let's say I didn't, let, let me get rid of the 469 now. How could you describe the area of the L-shaped thing? Take a minute to think about that, everyone. How can you describe in terms of X, the area of the L-shaped thing? Let's uh, say, raise your hands in the chat if you think you know what's a good, um, Whoops, I can move a lot of stuff around, but not that way. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. I see, Brett. I hope I pronounced right, but uh, Brett Braulio. Yeah, Braulio. How do you want to describe that in terms of X? So I would make, you see that little corner there? 
I would make a yes. square that's X by X. See a little corner right here, and I'll make a square, yeah. and that'll be X by X. So that's X squared. And you know that that from that rectangle, you have X and 30. So because of that 30 side, and then mm -hmm. you have the other one that you can add that to make that something in terms of X. That's right. Very good. So the L-shaped thing is split into three pieces. When you combine those three pieces, it becomes 60X. plus x squared. So it's a new question. The original question, you know, was, was what squared equals 1369? You know, I'll say y squared equals 1369. That was the original question. All we can do with that is estimate it that y is between 30 and 40. Now we have this new question. 60x plus x squared equals 469. Now that question is its own problem. It's a, it's a quadratic equation. You know, in, in, in theory, like in algebra, they would tell us to move everything over to one side and use quadratic formula guys, but we're not gonna do that. The sneaky trick is to factor out the X. Now, at this point, at this point, I could just test X equals zero, one, to up to nine to see which one works. You know, I could, this is, this is gonna be, we're gonna be able to narrow it down a little bit more than that. But even at this point, it's not that hard to go, okay, 61 times one is 61. That's too low. 62 times two, because see the X and X are the same number. So 62 times two is 124, which is too low. 63 times three, is 189, which is too low. And eventually you would get to 67 times seven, which is 469, which is just right. So seven will be the, the tens digit. Which coming back to here would mean this was seven and the answer was 37. Now, you might not want to try 61 times 1, 62 times 2, 63 times 3, 64 times 4, and so on. Maybe there's a way to get a better, a, a, get a close guess, like without having to try all nine. If you go back to this expression, notice that x squared is, is less than 100. because x is between zero and 10. Whereas 60x is you know, between 60 and 600, depending on how big x is. Really, re really, um, this isn't gonna be 10, but, but I guess it could be close to 10, so. So a sneaky shortcut is if you, if you just, temporarily just ignore the x squared. You get 60 x is 469. So x is approximately 469 over 60, which is somewhere around seven. Now seven may not be the answer, but it's, it's, it's either gonna be seven or it might be eight. Wait, <laughs> now I got it. Might be six. Hmm. If I if I ignore this x squared, 
my answer my answer for x would be um yeah it would be too big it would be too big because i'm ignoring the fact that i also have to add on an x squared to, to get that so it's either going to be seven or six it's possible that it goes down to five i, I mean i guess but I guess what I'm getting at is that this is a pretty good starting guess. If you divide this number by this number, it will get you pretty close. Uh, if it's not right, you could go down by one and you'll find it. Of course, on the final, you'll have a calculator and you could try one through nine. It wouldn't take that long. Oh, I see some hands up. Were those from before? I see Scott. Yeah, that was just a, a question. I tried to, you know, offering to give an answer on the uh, X issue. But I, 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 I'm a little confused why you're able to say X squared has to be less than 100. I mean, why does that, that X have to be between 0 and 9? Couldn't it be 11? So when I came over here originally, yep. I said I, I, I knew it was between 30 and 40. Oh, so right, right. Okay. Now, if I picked, if I act, if I picked 20, Right. If I just say I'm going to pick whatever I want, well, then right. X could be bigger. But I got if I accurately pick the first digit, then the right. other one must be less than 10. No, that makes sense. Now. I kind of lost track of that. Thank you. That's right. And these are great questions. Those of you who are math teachers uh, will definitely recognize the, the productive questions that Scott uh, asked. That's exactly what a lot of people are the same question people are like thinking. So very, very good. Now, that algorithm, you know, seems to be like a little bit like, like a lot of work to do, but we're gonna turn it into a, um, we're gonna turn it into an algorithm that doesn't require all the, the drawing of rectangles and stuff like that. But I would like you nonetheless to, um, to go over to the, um, Desmos, let me find that for you. So here's a question for you. It's the uh, square root of 2916. Would you please try to do this question with the whole draw square and chop off another square and see what we're dealing with? So we are going to get an algorithm, more of like a, we're going to get a um, more of a, computational algorithm that does these same steps without all the drawing of rectangle of squares and L-shaped things. But for now, if you go into the Desmos, uh, I, I typed in the code, but I'll type it in again, 3N, 3N4 KMA, I'll type that in. On your own paper, you draw the square and do all that stuff and then type your answer into the, um, the Desmos. The work is up. I'm gonna, I'll leave the work up and let me just 2916, 2916. So the question you're working on is 2916. You just want us to put the answer in Desmos? You don't, do you, do you want us yeah, to- Yeah, yeah, just put the Desmos. But on your own paper, you know, draw, I would like you for, for yourself to start by going like this. Yeah, understood. But yes, you just put your own an your answer in there.
Okay, so I'm looking at the dashboard. There's, there's, there's only 16, 16 people who have logged in to the Desmos, but of those 16, I see people working on the answer there. Hey, Professor, I have to do it on the, the chat, just FYI. I can't get into that. Yes, yes, that's okay. Yes, that's that. Okay, thanks. Okay, everyone. So I hope. Can I have more time, please? Oh, you okay? Question, Professor. Yes. Um, so I did everything up to like the, you know, like right before you get to guessing. Um, so mm -hmm. like at the end I started guessing, but was was there a sh not I don't want to say a shorter way, but was there a more logical way of doing that? Did you go over that or did I like miss that for some reason? When you say guessing, do you mean guessing right there, at, like where you're at right there? So okay, yes. Yeah. So fact, so so definitely factor out the x. Well, mm -hmm. so so factor out the x and put it on the right hand side. Okay. Yeah, I did. I did it up to right there, and then I started just guessing. But I was like, wait. Yes. Yeah, so well, you it get it pretty fast, way. right? What, so yeah, so it was very fast. Out? So it, that wasn't that wasn't a problem, but like let's say if it was like past like number five or six, you know? Yes, yes. So the little shortcut is if you were to temporarily back at this step, cross out the x squared, mm -hmm. that wouldn't affect your answer by very much because x squared is fairly small because x is fairly small. Yeah. It is. So x <laughs> is going to be approximately. 416 over 100, which rounds down to four. So that would get us the answer, or it would be like maybe one number too big. So by dividing this number by this number, you will get either get the answer or it will be maybe one off or two off. So, so in answer to your question, you could have jumped straight to the four with that strategy. Oh, okay. Thank you. And it only works because X is small. If X was big, that wouldn't, if X squared could be bigger than 100X, then that wouldn't work anymore. Now, in this step over here, this, th this one, it's also good sometimes, instead of even calling it X, to just go like 100 and blank time, I'm not even going to use an X, 100 blank times blank. That way you don't have the plus sign even. It's just like the last, the last digit. 101 times one, no. 102 times two, no. 104 times four worked. Now, 
let me go back to the first question and show you how you can do this without all the drawing and stuff. So square root of 13, 69. Uh, first thing we're going to do, and this is sometimes also called the long division method. It's based on the, it's, it's a algorithm based on the Chinese algorithm, but it doesn't use, uh, it doesn't use a picture of a square and it resembles long division. When you do the long division method, you group the numbers, the digits into pairs. So square root of 13, 69, you put the 13, the 69. If it was the square root of something with three digits, you would go 0257. So the last two digits become the group on the right. The next two digits become the group to its left. And if it has an odd number of digits, you stick a zero before the first digit so that it will have an even number of digits. And the way the long division method works, and you'll see how parallel this is to the Chinese dissection method. You start by looking at the number 13 and asking yourself, you know, the square root of 13 is between three and four. So you put a three, a smaller number, above the 13. Now that three is not really a three. That three is really a, a 30, 30 squared, 900. But for this algorithm, we could think of it as the square root of three, square root of 13 is close to three. Now, the reason this is called the long division method, uh, I'm gonna annotate this. Uh, I'm gonna write floor of square root of 13, just round it down. Here, I'm gonna put the number nine that came from squaring the three that I just got. And just like long division, you subtract. And just like long division, we bring down, but we bring down not just the next digit, but the next two digits. 469, look. That's the same 469 that was over here, that was over here, that was over, I don't know where else I had it written, but it's the same 469, but it's not, they're not visualizing the L-shaped thing. Now, listen carefully, because this step is the one confusing step of the long division algorithm. To get the next digit, the thing that goes up here, you do this, you take the three, your answer so far, and you double it. And then you make that the first digit of the unknown number. You go like that, 60, 60 blood. So this six becomes the six here. And this is saying 60 something times something is as close as I can get to 469. But you see that six, that's the same six. That doubling comes from the fact that there's a 30X and a 30X here. But you must double the three you have to become six here. Then you do 60 something times something, it was 469. And through trial and error, 67 times seven equals 469. So the seven goes here and the 469 goes there that 469, no remainder, perfect square. Professor, you know yes. how we had 416 and we divided it by 100 to kind of get it near there? Or is there a trick to do with this guess and check? Yes, and okay. Scott, that's an excellent question also. And the answer is, if you take the first two digits of the 469 and you divide it by just the six, the, the thing you got by doubling, that will get you the approximate answer. Ah, uh, awesome, thanks. Just curious, why does that work? Like that tricky stuff. The doubling, the doubling the three? Yeah. Did you mean why do we need a six here? 
Yeah, I know. How, I know. How, I know you got it because you double it. But why? I just want to know, like, why does it work? <laughs> Is it because of what you did in before? Yes. Okay. Yes, it has to do with this. The fact that there's 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 two of these thirty x's. Oh. So they okay. so so uh, so that's where this six came from. All right. That's why it works. Okay. And I actually have another answer for you that you might like even better. So we were saying, you know, square root of 13, 69. We knew it was 30 plus something. You might like this better. Imagine I squared the 30 plus X just to see what the deal was. I get 900 plus 60 X plus X squared, right? That's when you do FOIL, 30 plus X times 30 plus X, you get 900 plus 30 X plus 30 X plus X squared. So you do end up doubling, you know, the 30 and that equals uh, 1369, subtract 900 from both sides and you get 60 X plus X squared equals 13 equals not 469 that way also. So double, it doubles because uh, X plus A squared equals X squared plus two AX plus A squared. So that, that, that two A is why. Okay, I would like you now to use the so-called long division method to answer question number two, which so is square root. Question. Yeah. Um, just I, 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 what did you do after you doubled to get the seven? I don't know what. Um, kind of got lost in translation from that part. No, no, no. I, I doubled. I doubled the three to get yeah. this six here, yeah. and then the way I got the seven was I took that six and I stuck it into sixty blank times blank. And then I use trial and error. So the seven came. Uh, oh, okay. I from thought that was going, a decimal. Say, oh, oh, okay. So I didn't want to use an X because X was used before, but I, I, I'm going to put a time sign there. Yeah, it's times. 60 something times some, times the same something. These blanks are the same. And there's another decimal looking thing. These blanks are the same number. That's, that's key. You wouldn't want to do like 64 times six or something like that. Now, would you try to do this with the square root of 5184? This one, don't use a square. Do the, uh, the so-called long division method and put the answer into the, uh, the Desmos. Let me look at how people are doing there. For some reason, there are just there are 13 people. Oh, oh, I see, 13. There are three on page one still. I actually see what page you're on. There are 13, 14 people on page two, two on page three. So they're ahead 16. Okay, so it's not too bad. It is most uh, people. And this is a great question for the final exam. You know, use the uh, we're, we're going to call it the Chinese algorithm for square root. The 
Okay, so keep it going. One, two, three. And Vanessa asked, so you can use either, if you like to draw the square on the final, you can, or you can, uh, you can do it with this just purely, you know, algorithm with numbers. I, you, you'll probably prefer to just use the numbers, but you would be permitted to, to do it the other way if it, you know, if it made more sense to you with, with drawing the square and all. Professor, I got stuck at a step. Well, I got it. I think I got the answer, but it's just, I wasn't sure. Okay, well, let's take a look. I'll, I'll pop up the, um, did you have something like this? Let me see. Yeah, I got that. It's just, yeah, it's just when you see that 14, when you get to the 14 digit, I didn't know I was supposed to put a digit next to 14. So what ended up happening yes, was I got 14. 140, pounds yeah, I didn't have that. It's like <laughs> 140 something yeah. times the same something. Right. Yeah. yeah, I felt the same way, Marcus. It felt weird because the last time we only had one digit. Right. I was yeah, yeah. Like, what are we doing? Say that again, because I don't know. So, so, so the 14 are the hundredth digit and the, and the tens digit of the number on the left. So it's like 140, you know, 100. It, it's, it's a little strange of a notation because, you know, that, um, whoops, that um, usually we don't just stick things next to each other like that, you know, 140 blank, like that looks like it could mean 14 times. Mm -hmm. That's why maybe you prefer and, and I'm perfectly fine with it. Maybe you prefer to say 140 plus X times X. Because then there's no ambiguity. It's, yeah. it's obviously 100. But, but I think of it as like 140, you know, is it 141 times one? Is it 142 times two? Is it 143 times three? You know, that's how I think of it. But it is weird because there's no plus sign, you know, in the 14, it's like a 14 with a, with a, um, blank next to it. So if you can interpret that as 140 something, like it almost reminds me of like those, those puzzles, you know, one, four, a, you know, times a, where it doesn't mean 14, a, it means 140, you know, but the, the, the units digit is just being called a temporarily. Does this method work for on odd digit numbers or, or you just no, no, this, uh, place a zero this this method works i'm going to show you how to apply it for bigger numbers and even for irrational numbers so that's coming but, wow. we, but, but we have to do things like a, a little bit different i wonder i'm i know that yesterday i showed you how wikipedia was so wrong about pi um I'm just, I'm just curious uh, what it's going to say about square root, whoops. I'm just curious, like, again, Wikipedia is definitely not the, um, I think I, let me type long division square root. Strange. It's real famous. Long division square root method. Square root method, long division, long division method, square root by long division method. Uh, Khan Academy, which I'm not a fan of, looks like it has a pretty decent square roots by division method visualized long division method is this actually taught in schools then this technique a great question again this method keep in mind in math the five primary operations are 
adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, those you learn in school. And then the next one would be square root, of course. But what, what, what else would, if I said, I, you gotta give me one more mathematical operation, it would have to be square root. So up until the 1970s, 60s, you absolutely learned how to calculate the square root by hand with this method, the square root, the long division method. It was, it was in every textbook. It was the thing you learned in like sixth grade as a, you know, as, a, as just the next thing that you learned. So in the 1960s, they, you know, Sputnik and new math, <laughs> 19, uh, and they changed the math curriculum in the country uh, and they added some stuff. So they had to get rid of something and uh, square root was something that got cut out of the curriculum, which is something that is, uh, bothers me because I think it's a really important, there are so many other things I would have removed before learning how to take the square root by hand because what is math? I mean, that's the fifth most important math operation and we don't teach it anymore. So I love teaching these methods in history of math, but it, there's other things they should have cut out of, um, out of uh, the math curriculum, but why don't they chose like, to cut that. Why don't you like- Why Khan what? Academy? Why don't you like Khan Academy? Khan Academy? Yeah. I'm just curious. Well, so, Long ago, when it was just him making the videos, he was not a good teacher. You know, like I, I didn't find him to be a good enough math tutor. Um, but over the years, he, he hired some people to rewrite the lessons and they're a lot better now. But I, I still have the bad taste in my mouth from when he was almost at really in the beginning, you know, like when Bill Gates said that this was, the, best, the greatest thing he ever saw, and it got so famous, those videos weren't very good. Um, so as a math teacher, I was like, it was frustrating to me that such poor math tutoring was getting so much popularity. It's kind of like if I was like a great singer and there was some like bad singer that was way more famous than me, you know, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be jealous of them and justly so. So, um, but Khan Academy has improved, I think. So uh, it's not it's not so bad anymore, but it was pretty pretty bad in the beginning. Anyway, um, so now you know how to find the square root by the long division method, and this was the algorithm. You could get a textbook from 1960, go on Google Books, and you will see an elementary school textbook will have this algorithm in it as just the thing they learned, you know after they learned long division, because it was the next thing to learn. I know like 10 different square root algorithms <laughs> from various cultures. Uh, I love square root algorithms. It's like a hobby of mine. Oh, uh, Rarlo, is, is your hand up from previously? Or I just noticed a hand up. Uh, I think I, was, I may have pressed it twice the one time. Okay. Now, this square root algorithm is great. But up until now, we only know how to use it for uh, squares between, you know, 10, it, it only works for things less than 10,000 right now. Perfect squares, less than 10,000, at least from what I've taught you. So I need to uh, make that a little bit better. So let me show you how to do it for a bigger number. And we are not gonna use the, um, the, 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 the geometric way because it's kind of hard to, to make it work for the bigger. I'll show you what it would look like. So you'll see why we wouldn't want to, but I'm gonna show you the long division method, you know, that looks like long division for uh, the bigger number, for, for, for the larger numbers. Um, you might be interested though. Here's the, here's the one I just showed you. And that, whoops. So I wanna show you how to take the square root of five, whoops, don't look at that. Here you go. So here's a big instructive example. The square root of 56,169. That was the warm up question. 
That says 96, not 69. Oh, thank you. Now, we do not want to do this with the dissection, Chinese dissection, because it would end up looking like this. And it's, it has extra step, and it's very hard to visualize what's going on. So we're not going to do it that way. That's OK. It, th this way is based on what the Chinese method would be. So let me teach it to you right now. I, I, I should need to move. Uh... Oh, cool. I didn't know I could do that. I can move it up. Uh, step one is put it into groups of two, which requires us needing a zero. I'll tell you a little bit about why this step works, why this process works in a minute, but now I just want to show you the algorithm. Oh, hold on a sec. Someone, I'm, my phone is buzzing. Let me just make sure that's not an emergency. Okay, no emergency. Step one is to take the square root of five is between two and three. So you put the two up here. Step two is the same. Take two squared and put it here. Step three is the same. You subtract. Step four is the same. You bring down the next two digits. Step five is the same. Two times two is four. So 40 blank times blank is as close as possible to 161. If you want to do the, the uh, 16 divided by four is four. So the answer is approximately four. 44 times four though is, uh, is, one, uh, one, is 176, which is too big. 44 times three is uh, 120 is 132. So we put a three here. Whoops, 44 times three. Minutes. Sorry about that. I meant 43 times three is 129. So I, I couldn't get to 161. I got to 129. Subtract, we didn't have, we, before we subtract this became zero. This time, whoops. So we subtract. Get 32. Okay, new steps now. Bring down the next pair. And now let me make a highlighted thing because this is the step that's a little confusing that you just got to be careful about. The next step, just like before, we're trying to get, you know, as close as possible to 3269. But the thing that goes in front of this blank is not six, but do 23, the entire, before we just double the two. Now we're gonna double the entire number so far, which was 23, it becomes 46. So we say 460 blank times blank. That is the step that people get wrong when they get something wrong. They, 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 they wanna put a, uh, they wanna double the three, you know, just do 60 blank times blank. But no, you have to double the entire 23 to get 46. And you can now, you could do 326 divided by, or oh, sorry, 
you could do 32 divided by four to get approximation if you want. Or 320, yeah. You could do 32 divided by four to get approximation around eight. It turns out that 468 times eight is too big. But 467 times seven is just right. So that's how you do it when it's a three digit, you know, when it's a perfect square, uh, a three digit number square. We still have to see what happens when it's irrational number, but uh, oh good. We'll have that done by, by 11. Now, in case you're wondering about what was going on, again, if you could do this algorithm, I'm pretty happy. But I will tell you that the first step was kind of like saying 200 plus 10x squared is equal to 56169. And the second step was kind of like 230 plus x squared equals, uh, equals 56169. That's, I'm not getting into too much detail about it, but it's just kind of related to that. Let's have you do one on your own. Uh, let me just make sure. Is, is number three a question of that sort? Five, five, two, two, five. Right, that's not the question we just did. Okay, so, so on your own, would you please try to use this method? I'll just go over here in a blue box. You do on, on, on Desmos, if you, if you access it, 50, 55,225 using this method. I will leave this answer up on the screen so you can follow the process. Professor, do you always have to put the zero in front or you would group it 55 and 225? So you group it in, in, in groups of two, but if the oh. number had an even number of digits, you, you wouldn't put a zero before it. But if the, if the number has an odd number of digits, you put a zero before it. So you group from the right-hand side. And if, if you get a group with only one number in it at the end, you put a zero in front. Okay, thanks.
Okay, everyone. Yes, the answer is 235. So it's, it's and, and this would work for larger numbers and larger numbers. You just keep keep going through this process. Wikipedia, you type in methods of computing square roots, and it has all these errors, so, you know, contains original research, too technical for readers to understand. This is sad to me. Square roots used to have a prominent place in, in school math even. And now it doesn't even have a good Wikipedia page, methods of computing square roots. The, the square root method that I just showed you is listed here as all the way down in what they call digit by digit calculation. And it's too technical, you say, where they're explaining it all these A1 plus A2 to the second power. Look at this, that, that's terrible. Oh, got the sigma signals. And then finally, decimal base 10, they do an example. Professor, they, do you think- Yes. Do you think um, as a nation, we should go back to that and like also include like adding, um, changing, changing like our conversions to metric system like how far if you had the opportunity to like reform our education at least especially in this area what would you do i know it's well, a loaded question i don't have i don't have any strong feeling about the metric system uh but um well i think that uh i think that Stuff like this, like learning how to tech calculate square root is, is, is an important thing because it's, it's like the power of what can we do with you know, the most simple concepts, how far can, can we go with them? And it's like a worthy thing, you know, even though a calculator can do the square root, the thought process that goes into understanding these algorithms is like, has, is like exciting and it's kind of fun and that, and um, even though it's not practical anymore, I, I don't care about practicality of, of math. Um, I think people say that math is so practical and that's why everyone has to take it from kindergarten to 12th grade and required in college also. And I, I don't think it's true that math is, that, that we, math is practical, like engineers use it, but I think you could get through life with, only knowing math up until like seventh grade math. And for sure, most people forget every bit of math they learned after seventh grade anyway. Unlike when you learn English, you know, you, you remember the stuff you learned, you know, the words you learned, you know, things like that. So I think math is like a black hole where we put in all this, all this effort and make everybody take it. But, but we teach like the, the wrong things and we lie and say that it has to, we do it because it's practical. It's like saying in music, imagine if you told people, we're all taking band for 12 years because you need it. You need to be a musician in life. It's a lie. You don't need to be a musician in life. You don't need to be a mathematician in life. Maybe you like music, so that's good. So make it fun and people will like music. Make math more fun and people will like it and maybe they'll want to do it. So, uh, so I, I bring back the square root algorithm because I think it's intriguing. Uh, but if people really believed me that math actually isn't even really that important, uh, that they would actually, if I actually like convince people that we don't need to teach, we need to teach square roots because math is about fun and interesting and not about practical because it's a lie that it's practical. If I ever like con convinced people of that, they would actually make math into like music, you know, just a elective course that just a few kids. Right, right, right. So I, uh, yeah. so I shouldn't, so I, I should be happy that I have a job because if, <laughs> if, if people believe me, uh, there'd only be like one math teacher in the school. Right, <laughs> so. right, right. But thank you though. Thank you for whole, talking about it. Whole industries would collapse <laughs> pretty much. Oh no, no, enough people would, we, we'd have enough mathematicians still because as an elective, enough people would take it. Uh, 
we'd get enough output. We'd get enough mathematicians that we get now. We still get the same number because there they would be plenty of people who want to take it because because uh, they because they, they like it. I would suggest now, you might even get a yeah. few more because people won't hate math so much. Yes, good point. You might get even more, even though you're you're not selling the the practicality of it. You end up if the goal is to get people to to be science and engineers, you might actually get more. Thanks, Grant. I hadn't even thought of that, but that's true. So, uh, so who knows? Now, I'm going to finish before the break. Um, Can you go back, started... please? Yeah. Oh, oh, is this sorry? Because I was yeah. like trying to take notes on the steps. There you go. So the um, big step was the, the 46 was 23 times two. And then 461 times one is too small. 462 times two is too small. You would have a calculator on the final and you could, I wouldn't, I, I have no problem if you wanna just do 461 times one, 462 times two and build your way up. In the worst case scenario, it was 469 times nine. So it's only gonna take nine steps. At the worst case where'd you get the 46 from good question the 46 came from whoops the 46 came from doubling 23 at that point in the problem at that point all i had up here were the two and the three so i treated as a 23 at that point and double it to get 46 and 46 becomes the first two digits of the thing I'm multiplying by 460 blank times blank. And if, if there were two more digits in the question, you would then have to take 235 and double it 470 blank times blank to, to get the next step. So it, it would start becoming pretty big calculations. Okay, I hope was that was that able to did that answer where the 46 came from? Yeah, is it, would it be valid to just say what is the square root of the last two digits, which is five? Square root of 25 is five. Do you mean, hold on, hold on. We do that for the very first step. Hold on a second. No, that was just, that, that was just lucky. Oh, okay. That 25 had the square root of five. That was, that, that was coincidence. Okay. The five came from here, that 465 times five was close to 2,325. It, it didn't have anything to do with, um, with this 25 up here. Uh, question, what happens if you end up with the remainder? Do you keep going? Um, okay, that's, that, that, that's coming right now. So the last thing I wanna show you Although I will tell you that on the final, we're very likely to see a question like this. Final. We're very likely to see a six digit, six digit or five digit number. That's a perfect square. But I do wanna show you if the number is not a perfect square. Ultimate example, square root of two. So imagine I was trying to do the square root of two. According to this process, I would say square root of two is between one and two. So I'd put a one here, one squared here, and I get a remainder. When you get a remainder and you're, you're at the end of the process seemingly, remember I mentioned the square root of two, remember when I showed you that the square root of four was, let me use a different number. Square root of nine is three, square root of 900 is kind of the same, it's three, it's 10 times three, square root of 90,000, uh, four zeros is 300, but the square root of 90 
is, you know, around eight, <laughs> is, is around uh, nine point something. And the square root of 9,000 is 90, you know, 90 something. So the trick is when you run out of numbers, you multiply the ans the, the, the original question by 100, which adds two zeros to the, to the question. And then you bring down those two zeros and now you keep going. So we're basically doing the square root of 200 now. We take the one up here, one times two. Why is that happening? We take the one from here and we do one times two is two. So we do 20 blank times blank is less than or equal to 100. It ends up being 24 times four is 96. Subtract. Remainder, multiply the answer, the question by 100 again, bring down two zeros, take the 14 and double it, and then the 280 blank times blank is less than or equal to 400, it's one. And you keep going, but the decimal, Remember how there was originally a decimal point here? The decimal goes here in the answer. So we could keep going with this process. I don't think we're going to. I, I'm only interested in perfect squares, but I did want to show you before the break that this process could go on indefinitely. And you can, if it's an irrational number, you can keep on getting the square, you could keep getting the next digit. Uh, 400 minus 281 is 119. Bring down two zeros. Now I have to do 282 blank times blank is less than uh, is is less than 119 zero zero. I really start needing a calculator at this point. Okay, so just wanted to show you that the final exam would be this question, almost certainly. Love that question. This is because I did want you to know that it is possible to, to get square roots, digits of square roots that are not perfect squares. Okay, we're gonna do a, a break. That was pretty intensive. So I'm gonna give you a 15 minute break right now. I'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay.
Professor, there's someone in the waiting room. I actually got let in, thank you. Okay. I'm going to go pick up my glasses, G, after class. Oh, you can go out with that clothes. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> and your brain popping by your neck when you're doing that. How do you sleep? When you're doing anything, something coming up. <laughs> Stop! It, you're joking. Stop it. You want me to take the laptop from you? Then stop doing that. You that. Okay, everybody. So I am, um, I'm sure I'm, I'm, there's a, so I don't have to rush through things. There's a portion that was potentially going to be part of today's lesson that I'm switching to, to be tomorrow's lesson. So in this, um, in, these, in class number seven, there's some questions about square root method that I just showed you. And there's a thing I'm going to show you now 
But then there's a third thing, which is this list, list of 14 word problems. Those I don't want you to consider until tomorrow. It says here are the first, it says pretty clearly, these are not gonna be for tomorrow. These are going to be for tomorrow's lesson. Do not do any of these uh, tonight. So I think you'll know when you see that not to, but I just wanna mention it also. I wonder, format. So we just have to do the Delta math? Well, there's, there's Delta math and there's, um, there's, there's a couple of questions. There's four questions uh, like gotcha. this. Gotcha. Then there's, there's two Delta math questions. And th this part two, it's, it's part three that we're not doing. So let me just make a gotcha. note here. Um, I'll write it down. So parts one and two we'll do, but not part three. Gotcha. Gotcha, thank you. It's fine, because we're, we're, does anyone know, two years ago, were, were classes only two hours long and now they're, they're three hours? Has it been a change? I, I just noticed that I'm having a lot more time to not have to rush through things. It, were classes always two hours and 45 minutes or does anyone recall classes once being two hours even? No. They were shorter. Graduate school courses. They, were, they, 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 were, they, they used were to be hours. shorter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See, I'm, <laughs> that's really good. It's good that we have more time because I, I used to have to rush through this course a lot. And now I'm finding, oh, I have extra day even. So I, I can, I, I don't have to rush through this. Um, I could just move it to, to, to tomorrow, the, the thing I'm going to, was going to do at the end. So tomorrow will be, so that, that's good. More leisurely. So, class six homework is due tomorrow. Class seven homework is due Thursday. Oh yeah, yeah, we can make the homework. Uh, I don't mind if, since the only time I really am making a homework due the next class is when it's really <clears throat> uh, prerequisite for that next class. Like with the Egyptian, it was real important that, that you mastered and practiced the multiplication and division so that you could use that multiplication division for the uh, for the next class. But um, yeah, it's due in two, two classes. Okay, everyone. Now we've done square roots, square root algorithm. Hope you found that interesting, the di Chinese dissection method. But in China, they did a lot of their math with geometric interpretations. And that sort of characterizes Chinese math to me, that they visualized it geometrically and that led them to an algorithm that we could turn into an algorithm that's, that's just using numbers, um, but it's, it's got a geometric uh, motivation. And I mentioned there's this book, The Nine Chapters of the Mathematical Arts, which you could own for $460. I'll, I'll sell you mine for, <laughs> I'll sell you mine for 150 at this point because <laughs> I didn't use it as much for $200 as I hope. No, I, I, I guess I would sell it to you for, for uh, maybe what I bought it for, 200 or something. So it is great though. I love nine chapters of the mathematical arts. It's the equivalent of like, like, the, like Euclid's elements in, in, in Greece nine chapters of the mathematical arts. These chapters are about different topics. Like there's a chapter about systems of equations, for instance. Um, but chapter nine is the one I wanna focus on because chapter nine is about what they called the Gogu theorem. And what do those, those, those words mean? Well, in a right triangle, the two legs are the go and the goo. I forget which one is which, like is one the short one, one the long one, but they are the two legs. And the hypotenuse, I think I wrote it down, but then I lost I, I, or something like the shan. So the Pythagorean theorem, sorry, the, uh, 
what we call the Pythagorean theorem nowadays, a squared plus b squared equals c squared in a right triangle, was well known in China because the entire ninth chapter of the ninth chapter of the mathematical arts was, was based on it. Now, the Babylonians also knew that Pythagoras, keep, keep in mind, Pythagoras is 500 BC. Babylonians are aware of this relationship, you know, in 1600 BC. In China, they're using it extensively in the nine chapters of the mathematical arts, which is 800 BC. I mean, it's chapter nine, and I don't know when chapter nine became introduced into the nine chapters of the mathematical arts because it was refined. I'm sure there are scholars who have, you know, different editions and, and know pretty much every culture came up with what we call now the Pythagorean theorem. I believe in China, I'm not 100% sure about this, but that, that, they, that they still call it the Gogu -Go theorem. Now look at this picture. There's a lot of squares in this picture. And this is a geometrical demonstration of the relationship a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but it's not obvious how does this picture, uh, how does this picture relate to it? Let me show you a little diagram here. I made a link to this. It's a bunch of uh, dynamic sketches. So back in the day, and even, even still, the way you prove Pythagorean theorem in a modern geometry class, they usually prove Pythagorean theorem with some argument that uses similar triangles. But back in the day, when you said a squared plus b squared equals c squared, oh, by the way, thumbs up if you're seeing my image on the screen, just because I, I, I did a full screen, I don't know, okay, good. See, I have a right triangle here. And as I change the vertices, the size of the squares change. And most proofs of the Pythagorean theorem, when they say a squared plus b squared equals c squared, they mean it literally. They mean not just, oh, the number times itself plus the number times itself equals the number times itself, but they mean that the area of the square, uh, the, the two smaller squares combined equals the area of the larger square. And I have here various, various demonstrations that, that um, are based on that idea of making two squares, like um, here's one that, wait, hold on. to show you like another one. This is loading up kind of slow. Here's my favorite one. It's coming. Nope, that's not my favorite one. I'm looking for Perigold's proof. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, Perigold. Check this out. I love that picture. Look at that. A squared is this gray square. B squared are these four quadrilaterals. And then those same five pieces are reassembled like a jigsaw puzzle to create C squared. And what's neat about this is that if you don't believe those, pick, those pieces fit, I could actually just slide them like a jigsaw puzzle. So a lot of Pythagorean theorem proofs are geometrical in this way. There's actually a book that's called the Pythagorean Proposition that has 256 different visual proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. And that book you could download from Google Books. Uh, Cut the Knot is a good math website. 
uh, Pythagoras. He has 100 proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. Let's just glance at that for a second. This guy died a few years ago, but luckily they're still maintaining uh, the website. So here he has proof number four. Oh, look at that. In proof number four is the picture I was just showing you. That's a little surprise. Um, as he goes through, they get more and more intense. But most of them have um, some sort of picture with three squares in them. Oh my God. How many are there? Look at that. I mean, I think he has a hundred, but I'm just curious. Wow. Let's see how far this goes. <laughs> oh, over a hundred. And how many? Hundred and so he does 122 uh, proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. The book, The Pythagorean Proposition, has 256 proofs. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot of proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. Sadly, in, um, in, in, when you took geometry back, whenever you took it, they almost certainly proved it uh, with similar triangles. Um, maybe something like that. And they would say like A over hypotenuse over short side is equal to hypotenuse over short side is equal to hypotenuse over Hmm. I forget how that proof goes. Oh, well, I should, I should never, never bring up something that you haven't reviewed before. Doesn't matter. What matters is I want you in your groups now to stare at this picture for a good five or 10 minutes and see if you can, there's a lot of squares in this picture. And there's also some triangles in this picture. So I want you to, and this is on the, um, if you go here, page number four says, this is a diagram for something called the Zo B. How does it demonstrate ghost, ghost squared plus Q squared equals Jan squared? Explain how this can be used. Check this out. This isn't just a picture though. If you come here, because you see the, the, these tools, you can actually draw on this. You could change the color. So if someone wants to share their screen, you could be drawing on this thing. You could change the, um, the thickness. You could change the color. You could draw on it. Let's put you into groups for about 10 minutes to talk about this. And I'm going to uh, put you into the groups now. So uh, breakout rooms. So I said this confused yesterday. One, two, and three are for math teachers. Four and five are for math majors. Pick your own room and here you go. Could you put me in three, Professor, please? Yes. Thank you. There you go. Okay, anyone else need to be uh, placed into a room? Okay, who uh, of the four people here? Roll call. Arafat. 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes, what group do you want to be put to? Five. Five? Oh, uh, put me in four. There is no one in five. Oh, there's nobody in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Molly, what room do you want to be put into? So Nilla?
Um, I had to walk away for a minute. Are we in breakout rooms? Uh, yes, yes, we're in breakout rooms.
John, did you figure it out? Hey, everybody. Uh, by the way, what's on the screen now is 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 that other thing that I was trying to figure out. I just wanted to, to show you the um, the standard way that most math teachers and textbooks nowadays prove the Pythagorean theorem is by drawing a right triangle with hypotenuse sort of as the base and drawing an altitude splitting the right triangle into two smaller right triangles that are each similar to the original because they, they, they're both right triangles and they share an angle. And then using proportions, they create these two proportions, cross multiply to get this, and then add both sides together to get the Pythagorean theorem relationship. It's a good proof. It's not a very pretty proof. It certainly doesn't have the multi, uh, all those nice colors. Um, it may, the other proofs might give more of an insight than similar triangle proofs. The Greeks did not like similar triangle proofs. They liked, uh, they avoided similar triangle proofs for a very sophisticated reason that we'll talk about when we do the Greeks uh, next week. So let's look at this thing now. So this is a picture, whoops. Okay, uh, anyone wanna raise a hand and just did, did anything interesting come up in any of the discussions? I was just curious what, what people were, were, were saying about this picture, any insights that you came up with? Okay, Scott. Oh, Scott, you could unmute. Uh, Joel, Joel and I were uh, looking at the diagram and talking it out. And I think he thought it was interesting that the larger square of seven by seven could be decomposed into four rectangles with one square in the center um, with each rectangle having a diagonal that went from vertex to vertex, which created two equal measurement right triangles. That's right. We have this big seven by seven square and we have sort of, I'll put a lot of threes and fours here. And there are these, there are these rectangles, these ones. Each of those has two triangles. There's also this very like pesky little guy in the middle. He's not part of any of those. If, if we imagine the eight triangles, here, I'll, I'll make two of them green. I'll make two of them blue. It appears to be the square of the difference of them. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so that little one is one squared, which is four minus four minus three squared. That's right. Here, I'll make it nice. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's actually ten different things. There's there's eight, three, four. There's, there's eight right triangles with three and four as the legs. There's this little square in the middle, one by one, and this, this, this large square. But it's hard to interpret this. We, oh, we also have this square this sort of slanted square, which is like the square formed with that, where the hypotenuse is the, is the side length. 
Well, we could say just, let's say, I don't know how the area of that square. Let's just say all I know is this stuff, right? This, this slanted square isn't easily, I suppose we could probably count these little squares inside, but some of them are like cut off. But we could say that the green square is 49 is, 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 is the big square minus four of these, uh, these, these three by four square, these three by four um, triangles where two of them together would become a rectangle. I'm gonna write four times, I'll write one half three times, one half three times four, which is the area of, of each of those triangles. There are four of them. So it's 49 minus 24, which is 25. Oh, I see it now. <laughs> so, the, so that would make the side is the square root of 25, which is five. So that's interesting. I did it in reverse. I did the, the area of the tiny square is one and the area of each of the internal triangles was six and I added those together and got 25. Oh, interesting. So that doesn't utilize these atoms. So you so or one, remember, because that little yellow square, which hasn't really been talked about, it almost like, why do we need to even talk about it in the first way? But we could build it up the other way and say this green square is the small square plus four triangles, which ends up being 25 also. Hmm. I'm going to make this a little more al algebraic and just see what, what we can do with that. So check out this picture. I like this one. So this is the one, this, this was, uh, this is looking at um, the big square, the A plus B, like, like instead of thinking about how big is the slanted square, I could just think what's the relationship between all these shapes. So if I call the sides of the right triangle A and B, the big triangles A plus B in parentheses squared. But it could also be thought of as the slanted square plus the four yellow triangles. This, this one, by the way, doesn't, it doesn't use this, this middle thing at all. So let me just, I'm, I'm gonna actually remove it. Whoops. This one actually doesn't even use these guys. I should take them out also. Whoops. Huh. I can move. I think I should just go like that for this picture. As as far as the as far as the relevant information. And I'll make a third color for, for the outer thing. So the A plus B squared is the big outer blue triangle. The C squared is the um is the slanted square and the yellow is the four triangles. So that picture would explain it pretty nicely, the relationship between the blue square, the green square and the four triangles, which if we use some modern kind of like algebra here, FOIL and such, this thing on this four times one half AB would become two AB. And it'd also be a 2AB when you expand it out, A plus B squared. So I like that. But uh, there's another interpretation. In this one, we just look at, this is kind of, this is similar to the second one. Remember it was also described over here that we could do it by, by adding together one, the, the small square, the tiny one in the middle, plus the four triangles. So if we just generalize that one, look what that looks like. C squared, the, the green thing, 
is equal to, it's made up of five pieces, the four triangles plus the, that little square in the middle. So four times one half AB, that little square in the middle is a one by one square because it's, 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 it's four minus three. And if you expand this thing out, you get 2AB. And B minus A squared, if you use some modern, some modern FOIL thing, you get minus 2AB plus A squared. And the 2ABs cancel out. So those are two ways to interpret this picture to demonstrate that A squared plus B squared. Now this is a very special picture because this little square in the middle, which is needed for this version, though it's not needed for, um, it wasn't needed for, for this one. But that little square is a one by one square because A and B were one apart from each other. If, if it was like a 5, 12, 13 triangle, it wouldn't be as pretty of a picture because that little square in the middle that was a one by one square would now be a seven by seven square. Just wanted to kind of mention that. It's a little hard to generalize this picture. You know, I almost wonder, is this just a picture demonstrating just the single fact that three squared plus four squared equals five squared? Is that, you wouldn't really need a whole picture to demonstrate that, I, so, so I'm not sure. Oh, I should have mentioned the Egyptians, we, we, we know the Babylonians had Pythagorean triples because they um, plumped in 322. But the Egyptians had Pythagorean triples and especially the 345 one because in Egypt, I, I forgot to mention this back, they would um, make a, a big string that would be um, uh, five, that would be 12, 12 units long and they would put like knots so that there would be 12 of them. And then they can take this thing and like rearrange it into a three, four, five triangle. And that would get them a nice right angle that they would need. I think the expression rope stretcher like has something is, is, is a relevant word in the history of math. Let me just see if I type in rope stretcher. I, I've seen like people say it like trigonometry means rope stretcher. Let me just take a look what they're talking about with rope stretcher and, and what it means. In ancient Egypt, a rope stretcher was a surveyor who measured real property demarcations and foundations using knotted cords. So sorry, uh, I forgot to mention that. They don't really say that much about it. Rope stretchers use three, four, five triangles and the plummet, which are still in use by modern surveyors. So it's a picture of, of a rope stretcher. Okay. So professor, I'm a little confused. Are you prepping us to prove the algorithm they use or is this something the Chinese actually did? Well, this diagram is in their books. So okay. they, they, they use the Pythagorean theorem and this is yeah. sort of like a informal proof of it. Okay. It, it, suggests, uh, this, it suggests a proof that's kind of like the square root algorithm in that yep. it's, it's, it's geometric. Like there's, there's like pieces that you can like assemble together one way or another way. Yeah. Like you could look at this picture as you could look at the blue thing as a big blue thing or as a collection. So it's just their demonstration of Pythagorean theorem. It's not an algorithm. Okay. It's a relationship between A, B, and C, which then they'll get to use once they have it. Gotcha. So the algorithm will just be, they'll tell you A and B and you'll figure out C eventually. Now, this is a pretty famous picture. They, in, in the night, in Lui, uh, Li, Liu Hui's commentary on the nine chapters of the mathematical arts, he describes in words a proof of the Gogu theorem. And it's very ambiguous. He's talking about a red triangle and a blue triangle, yet somehow 
they have reconstructed it into this, this diagram on the right hand side. This diagram. And I'm going to put you back into groups. How are we doing time wise? Oh. Hmm. If I'm okay, so let's just take a look. Here's here's two squares, A and B. Now I'm going to color these in red and blue, just so make A squared in a, in a, in a blue outline and B squared in a red outline. Now, if I draw another line, namely from this corner to this corner, that will, because here's B also, that will be the hypotenuse of this right triangle here. There's a, there's a right triangle. I'm going to color that right triangle purple. And the length of that diagonal we'll call C. And if you then produce an entire square on that C, it ends up looking like that. And I drew an extra line because it's going to be useful. I just stuck in this extra line, that little guy, because he doesn't have it, or a lot of the diagrams don't have it, but that line is an important line to help us see what's going on here. Together with Leo Hui's explanation, check out, check out this. Now, how can this with the coloring be used to prove how to prove a squared plus b squared equals c squared with this picture? Now, I put this into the Desmos as its own. Um, let's see where that is. Oh, no? How did I? Hold on a second. There it is. I um, visual proof of Gogu theorem. That's going to be our last slide. You could draw on this. Okay, I'm going to put you into groups for about five minutes. Back to the groups to try to see if you what you come up with, and I'll show you the answer. Okay, so, so Nilla, are you here?
Okay, everyone. I like what I was seeing there. Check this out. I think you're like this. Here, I have the picture with certain pieces are, are colored in. I, there, there's in the A squared plus B squared picture. I, I just, I, I, I broke it up into, you know, these uh, two tri three triangles and two quadrilateral looking things. And see the ones I made pink? Watch what happens when I click flip. Oh, wow. What happened was that three pieces, this little blue triangle moved from here to here. The brown one went from here to here and the gray one went from here to there. So those same four, five pieces, sorry, two pink pieces, a blue, a gray, and a brown get rearranged to become, so it's A squared plus B squared, and now it's C squared. So I love <laughs> looking at that back, back and forth. Very cool. Um, and here is, here it looks, um, so you have access to that also. Um, here, here's the, here's the picture like that. Although it's kind of hard to see, it's hard to see it when, when, when you do it like this, like what, what actually moved. Um, it's a little easier when, when you, when you have different colors. Now I should let you know that this is not the only interpretation of his words. This is just a very cool one that, um, but, uh, there are other ones that are much that that are that are actually more confusing. Here, L U H U I Pythagorean. Uh, I'm gonna write this. Uh, I'll write Pythagorean theorem. Proof. And if I go to images, you can see that not only is do they have this one that I just showed you, but they have this one. <laughs> so, so people don't really know exactly what his proof was. So these are like the two interpretations based on the words that, that, that he used. So I just wanted to mention that it, it, it is speculation. It says here, a proof is in a book. No, I'd have to get access to that. But that would... Anyway, uh, a lot of people just say, here's like a Prezi. So here's someone just, I wonder what what they're gonna say. Let's see, I've never, Prezi, it's loading. Okay, was he? Was he contributions? And ah, I see they're using that one. Here's the proof. The shorter leg multiplied by itself is the red square and the larger leg multiplied by itself is the blue square. Let them be moved about so as to patch each other, each according to its type. Because the differences are completed, there is no instability. They form together the area of the square on the hypotenuse. Extracting the square root gives the hypotenuse he describes this proof as the diagram giving the relations between the hypotenuse and the sum and difference of the other two sides, whereby one can find. So it's really, um, so they, this person, just a random person, is, is, is using this other proof by dissection. I like this one, whether it was the one that he came up with or not, or that he was describing. We don't really know, but it's cool regardless. Now, homework is just to do these square root algorithms. And could you do this a little write up of the Leo Hui dissection and of those other two things? Just what, what exactly what I did in class, but just to just write up a few sentences to show that you kind of understand the three. We did like three proofs of Pythagorean theorem. One looked like this. And then we had two different ways of interpreting uh, this You're picture. So just kind of like, did yeah, I it's not it? showing up. It's not showing up. Oh, sorry. The three proofs that we did were um, one, one, two, three. 
So, so just to like write a few words, like if you wanted to explain it to somebody in a few sentences, I just want to make sure that you have like pondered these three a squared plus b squared equals c squared proofs. Okay, I'm gonna stick around today. First time in a couple of days I can stay. So I'll hang until 1230, everyone else. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'll stop the, um, the recording. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I need to post the last two recordings.